Hey guys, happy Friday and welcome back to my channel. How is the lighting on this video? I'm out here in the park and it's hard to tell because like I said, I have a sp spring protector on my phone and it's kind of hard to tell what the lighting looks like, but I'm going to go ahead and, and dive right on in. So I was inspired to do this video topic as I'm always inspired, just by life in general, right? But you guys know I'm a third year PhD student in the clinical psychology program. And in psychology and in psychotherapy and counseling, like there's this push for counselors to become culturally competent. Now the reality is no one really can become culturally competent. You can try to be culturally competent. You can ascribe to cultural competency, you know, you can shoot for it, but there really is it's not possible to be culturally competent. That's to be culturally competent is to say that you are proficient in working with people from all different cultures, all different backgrounds, and you basically have no room for improvement. So instead of cultural competency, um, people have replaced that term with cultural humility, cultural attunement. And in my class the other day, it was some discussion, uh, a student brought up how she struggles at her current placement. She's working at a jail in, in, with, in, with prisoners, and she struggles with uh, the ability to be able to understand <laughs> her client's emotions. Now, given we know that, we all know that most people who are in jail or prison it's filled with predominantly African Americans or Hispanics, right? So you can get an idea now. She's white, her clients are black, Hispanic, mostly I'm pretty sure predominantly black. And this is not nothing new. She brought it up, but it's something that has been brought up, you know, often. How people have a hard time getting certain populations, particularly uh prison population and African Americans and even Latinos to express their emotions, particularly I think African Americans. And I think that when it comes to emotional expression, it's not just the difficulty, I guess, or I want to say difficulty, that's a bad word, but the difference in how certain populations express their emotions has been a concern. Because in white dominant culture, they have a certain understanding of what emotional expression looks like, right? Like they want to want to see people be happy or want to see people express their anger, you know. And there's this thing how that is often said that black people, we only show certain emotions. So certain emotions we so-called keep hidden while other emotions you know, we are not afraid to express, let's say, for example, anger, right? And I'm like, I don't know, that's kind of like an overgeneralization when you think about it. But at the same time, it has some truth to it because within certain populations, I will say African American, there is some inhibition of an emotion, especially when it comes to being vulnerable. So in this video, I'm going to talk about all of that, especially as it relates to the professional context in which I work because it can be frustrating you know especially being an african-american and being misperceived or being misunderstood you know people just don't get it they don't get it so that's the reason why I do these videos to try to help people get it and of course there's a lot of literature out there and a lot of the literature is from a white person's perspective, a white, res white researcher's perspective, you know. Which I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with that, but it's still biased. It's one-sided. There's so many different ways a person, so many different ways that a certain topic can be understood, right? So here I am bringing my conceptualization of this topic, emotionality and cultural considerations in psychotherapy. Now, it's interesting because... Currently, there is a poll on one of my uh, pages, Ubawa, spelled U-B-A-W-A. -A. It's my literary organization that I founded back in 2010. I decided to launch a poll on there. Just to, It's more of like an informal kind of survey to see where people stand, like on their views as it relates to going to therapy. Because I'm curious. I mean, the literature says one thing, right? In the literature, they say... Oh, well, 
it doesn't matter the race of the therapist. Research has shown that black clients can benefit from going to therapy. It doesn't matter the race, right? And I just get so annoyed by it. Like, it doesn't matter the race. Like, they just want everybody to be all inclusive. There's nothing wrong with culture inclusive inclusivity. But at the same time, I think with that, sometimes we leave out the cultural aspect. It's like, okay, yeah, we're integrated society. But it's almost as if we're so integrated that people miss the cultural component. And that's so important. To assume that all African Americans or most African Americans think that it's okay to just be seen by white psychotherapists, that is not true. That's not facts. There's nothing, no, we're close to that. Yes, some African Americans may say, okay, I'm open to going to see a therapist from a different race but you have a lot of African Americans that they don't buy that they're like hell no give me a black therapist I'm black only person that can understand me is black and this is not me just saying this this is pe this is from our observation this is from people who have said this and you guys if you want to go see for yourself go to the page I'm talking about Ubawa U-B-A-W-A -A. the direct link is facebook.com slash urban authors urban like urban city authors urban authors on facebook go there there's a recent poll that i actually launched today and the question says if you were struggling with depression or anxiety and you wanted to enlist the help of a psychotherapist which therapist would you prefer very straight to the point very direct and the options, because Facebook only allows two options on the polls. I don't know why. I actually wanted to include the third option, which would be, it doesn't matter. But the two options, straight to the point, a white therapist. I actually put a white therapist first because I want to make it seem like, okay, I'm kind of imposing my preference on the people who are going to take this, uh, the poll. So I went ahead and put the white one first. A white therapist, and as for A, the option A, and then I put a black therapist for option B. Now, the poll was just launched today, so it's probably less than eight hours old. And I've looked at the responses, and so far, 100% of the people who have voted, and I think I've gotten 15 votes by now, I don't know, it's probably past 15, I'm sure. It's maybe close to 30 by now. But hopefully the helicopters don't interfere with my connection, because they tend to fly over and be messing up my connection, so let's see can we get through this. But looking at the responses, most people, 100% of the people, have said they prefer a black therapist. And I'm not surprised. Now, some white people may see this, and especially white therapists or psychologists, my colleagues even, may see this and may take offense to it. They may see it and they be like, well, damn. She's trying to get them to, I'm like, no, you can't say it as me. That's them. Because the one thing about the people who follow Ubawa and any of my pages, they real. They keep it real. They keep it 100% real. They will tell you how they feel. They don't hold back. They're going to let you know the truth on what it is, you know. And some will say, okay, no, white people do this. I like white people better. Or they will let you know. But the responses have been 100% black. The 100% of the responses are black. Zero people endorse a white therapist as their preference. And I find that to be quite interesting and informative. Like I said, the literature says one thing. Literature may say, oh, no, it don't matter the race. You know, a white therapist can be just as effective in working with a black client. And I'm like, okay, how do we measure effectiveness in this context? Because effectiveness can mean many different things. When it comes to building rapport, which is, is the most, I think, important mechanism for bringing about change. I mean, Carl Rogers would attest to this. He was a humanistic psychologist. And he reigned, I think, between the 1940s and the 1980s, if I'm not mistaken. He will attest to this, that the most important mechanism for change is rapport. Having empathy. You do that by having empathy. By listening to your client. Your client being able to identify with you. Those are things, traits, that increase and promote rapport. Having that connectivity with the, between the client and the therapist that is so important if a black client African American client goes into a therapist's office who is white and they have already because everybody walk around with preconceived notions so we can't ignore that 
And it's not that you blame people for their preconceived notions because it's based on socialization of that person. Now, yes, once they is brought to their awareness that, oh, you have this kind of bias or you're this way, then, yeah, they can work on maybe doing some things to own that and maybe try to work towards positive change. But aside from that, everyone carries with them preconceived notions, these cognitive schemas that shape our thoughts, our feelings, our behaviors. And so, like I said, everybody, men, women, black people, white people. So when a black client walks into the therapist's office, who is white, and the black client carries with him or her these preconceived notions about white people. And we know, I mean, I probably may do another open-ended survey where people can, black people can just talk about how they think in their perception. Oh, Lord, yeah, I'm at this part. But they can talk about their perceptions. And I don't even really, I, oh my gosh, really? She want to be part of my video. Hopefully, I can get through this. But we can hit. We can. Um, we can see this on social media. How black people think about white people. This is not new information. Y'all know this stuff. You know. We know that there is a certain. Oh my gosh, y'all. Maybe I should not have done it at this part. Hmm. I'm gonna try to get through this, y'all. These kids are screaming. I am at a park. But, yeah, it's like black people, yeah, and it comes from slavery. These perceptions and attitudes that black people have in their mind with regard to, and I'm not to say all black people. I'm talking about generally speaking. Some black people actually have a positive bias towards white people. And they're like, you know, white people do things better. White businesses are better, you know. And I talked to you guys a little bit about the stages of black identity development in a previous video. So you guys go back and watch that. But black people within our uh, culture, within our ethnic group, there's a variety of different attitudes that black people hold with respect to white people. So it's not that all black people look at white people as the enemy or like they're going to do something to them or they're bad people, you know. Some black people actually hold, put white people on a high pedestal. And they have a very positive regard towards white people. So it varies. But I'm just saying, we can't ignore the fact that, yes, some black people have a certain type of perception of white people. You know, sometimes we dismiss it. It's like, oh, well, not all black people do. Some, white, some black people actually have a positive. Okay, that's one thing. But to just totally dismiss the group of people who don't have that positive bias towards white people, it's like you're missing a really important part. And when it comes to going to seek therapy and help, that's important. And we wonder why there's a question that's asked, why don't black people go to therapy? What are the barriers to therapy? A lot of that is because of, it's in the literature too. You see this also in the literature. There have been studies to assess black people's perception of therapy. And a lot of them have said in qualitative studies that they don't think white therapists under, can understand them. Now, being black myself and have gone through therapy, and not just therapy, but being in white institutions, <laughs> I can attest to that to myself. And that's kind of part of the reason why I want to do this video, because oftentimes I am misunderstood, even in my own institutions, around psychologists who claim to be culturally aware. You know, this is the whole thing about we are culturally diverse. It's like they pride themselves in being culturally diverse, right? I'm like, what does that mean? I did a video about cultural diversity and the differences between New York and L.A. with respect to cultural diversity. That's another video topic I did a few days ago, and you guys go check that out. But I said that, I mean, I think we kind of throw around that term very loosely, cultural diversity. It doesn't mean the same thing for me. A place can be filled with many different people from many different ethnic backgrounds. I don't mean that that place is culturally diverse. Another, I think, most important component of cultural diversity for a city to be considered culturally diverse is that there is an appreciation for those different cultures, those different ethnic backgrounds. Because L.A., okay, based on just the definition that it means that people, it, the city consists of many different people from many different backgrounds, okay, yeah, by that definition, L.A. is culturally diverse. 
But my, by, by my definition, it's not, because it means that it's lacking in appreciation for certain cultures. And then when a city has a high degree of racial oppression, how in the hell can you say that's culturally diverse? There's no way racial oppression and cultural diversity can sit together. No, that's an oxymoron. That's a contradiction. To say, oh, well, we're culturally diverse, but there's still racial oppression. And with racial oppression, there's a suppression of a person's culture. And you see a lot of African Americans feeling they have to transform. And even not just African Americans, but the majority race in LA are Hispanics. Yet they are still called minorities. There's something to be said about that. And even Hispanics, you see them, they are transforming to be white. I come across Hispanics and you look at them and you're like, dang, you think that they're white. You talk to them, they're white. But you ask them how they identify, they say, no, I'm Latino, I'm, I'm Hispanic. And I'm like, okay, you are. But so much of you, your presence, your demeanor is saying that you're white. It's something to be said about that, y'all. Because me, I come from a perspective, especially com coming from from New York City and moving to LA, I'm of the persuasion, because I see it in New York and that's why I love New York so much, that people get to be themselves. The Hispanics are true blood Hispanics. They're not trying to be white. They ain't trying to talk white. They ain't trying to do nothing white. They are themselves white because the city of New York embraces people from their culture. They don't put them down. There's Not to say there's absolutely no racial oppression, but on a scale from one to, uh, let's say, one to ten, or one to one hundred, is very minimal. Maybe I don't know. Very small. Maybe two. I said two. You know. And I've lived in New York for a couple years before moving to LA. But maybe I should take this off. It's just getting kind of hot. But yeah, New York. I mean. I love New York because people really get to be themselves, you know, and it's not about, oh, and I think I checked the statistics for New York and white people do make up the majority, but it doesn't feel like, oh, it's a white dominated society in New York. I swear it doesn't feel like that because there's so many different people from so many different cultures and nations and everybody is very centered in their cultural identity there. You know, with respect to the foods that they eat, the way they dress, the way they talk, their language. That is something important. Shanta says, I don't feel like black people don't have the same resources as white people. Also, the media always showing white people as if black people don't go to school for anything. Yeah. That's another thing. Even in our uh, general society, the context of our society is like there is this push for white dominance and all you see is just white people everywhere you know there should be more like diversity more appreciation for people from many different cultures it's not just portraying black people in this certain light like okay only thing we known for is entertainment you know or music you know or drugs you know or bad things but it should be more of a push for if we talk about inclusivity that make us feel like we valued, you know? That's so important. That is really important. Cultural appreciation, that factors into cultural diversity. You can't say a city is diverse, culturally diverse when there's so much racial oppression and there's so much cultural suppression. So that's really important. Now back to this topic of cultural competency in the context of psychotherapy and why a lot of African Americans just don't feel like they want to go to therapy. Not that they don't need help. Hell, if anybody needs the help, we do. But it's being understood, feeling like, okay, when I go into this therapist's office, they get me. And a lot of times, black people just don't feel that way. They don't feel that way. And when you look at the numbers of psychologists, psychotherapy, I mean, I think there were more master's level psychotherapists who are african-american than there are doctoral level psychologists who are african-american but according to ABA, apa i saw a statistic that we only make up like two percent of psychologists black people only make up two percent of psychologists 
in the U.S. And I'm like, okay, there's something to be said about that. That's why white people don't get it, but that's why it's so important when you see black people, these ethnic minorities going to get their PhDs and going to enter these arenas, these professions where we are not as represented. You know, we're less represented because it means something, not just to ourselves, but it means something to our race, to our ethnic group. That is so powerful to see more black people. It means something to our culture for them to see that it's more of us who are represented. And then they can go and they can get help that they need because black people need help. It's not that they don't want to go to therapy. I think that they want to benefit. Money ain't no excuse because there's Medicaid. Med in California, they call it Medi-Cal. So it covers for not just physical health, it covers for mental health services as well. Black people want to get help. They're open to it. It's not so much, oh, there's a huge stigma on it, so that's the reason why they don't want to go. They don't care a fuck about it. Black people don't too much care. Yes, there's a stigma, but I don't think that's the biggest barrier. It's feeling like they're going to be understood. And when you see who are the therapists out there, it's mostly white people, mostly people who are not black. Now, there is a website called uh, Therapy for Black Girls, which I love, and I think they're based in Atlanta, Georgia. And that's the thing I love about Atlanta, too, because, number one, Atlanta is predominantly African-American. And on top of that, there are so many successful black entrepreneurs there in Atlanta. There is like, it's a black mecca. Black people feel like, okay, this is our shit. We own, we own something at least. You know, that's one place where we can feel like we own something, which is in Atlanta. And the person, the lady, I think it's a lady who founded that website, Psychotherapy for Black Girls. Therapy for Black Girls. You guys Google it. And they have all, like I have a whole bunch of black psychologists and master's level therapists and MFTs, you know, M MSWs, uh, Masters in Social Work, on there. It's a great resource for people to start. And then you also have ABSI, Association for Black Psychologists, that black people who are seeking psychotherapy services and particularly want to see an African-American therapist go to, that's another resource that you can go to abpsi.org I think it's .org or .com Google it A -B -Psi -P -S -I. and then therapy for black girls but yes it does matter the race so I just I don't know I kind of get bothered when you have research studies and these are published research studies in professional journals peer reviewed journals that will make the claim oh it doesn't matter the, the race it's like no I think y'all saying that for y'all best interest that's the, for the best interest of these white therapists to say, oh, it doesn't matter because, of course, they want to see more black clients. I mean, I get it. You want to serve, I guess, more of a diverse population, perhaps. But even still, I'm like, I don't know if that is quite true because there's also a study that was done called not taking any more clients. Now, when you Google it, it may be hard to find. But I actually cited this study in one of my papers during my first year in my PhD program and pretty much what this, the basis of the study was that there, I think it was done out of Harvard. It was done out of a very prestigious university. And these researchers had a script they gave to, um, they gave to the therapist and they had, I'm trying to remember, it was set up so no, it was set up so that they there were participants in the study who were either black or white. I think there were people from many different ethnic groups, right? Let's say black, white, and Hispanic. And with the uh, variability in their race came variability in the names too, and variability in the way they sound, their voices. And so they had these participants call and leave uh, a message on these therapists' voicemail to say they were seeking services. Basically, the results of the study found that, <laughs> and it's sad, that the majority of these white therapists, when it, they found out that it was a black person, you can tell the person that they black just based on how they sound, the tone of their voice, typically anyway.
sometimes you can't tell, but typically, you know, black people do have a certain way that they sound, and then, of course, white people. Like I said, typically, of course, there's a certain exceptions to the rule where you have black people who sound white or vice versa, but typically, and even also with the names that they left on the voicemail, right? So, a name like Ronisha, for example. I mean, we know that's a black name. Not to say a white girl can't have a name as Ronisha, but typically that's a black girl's name. And what they found was that when it was a black client, potential client seeking therapy, they didn't get, really get a call back. But when it was a white person seeking therapy, they got called back. That's a bias. That goes to show that there's a bias within psychotherapists to favor white clients, to want to take in white clients over black ones. Now again, that could speak to their level of cultural competency, their perceived level of cultural competency, because these white therapists may figure like, okay, maybe I'm not that culturally competent, so I'm not going to accept any black clients. And it's hot out here, y'all, in L.A., in the end of October, like, hot in the hell, it's still hot. But yes, I could speak to their perceived level of cultural competency on top of their own personal bias for who they want to work with or they want to treat. That's the thing. You will have black therapists and even um, upcoming therapists, black therapists that will say they prefer, they will say it freely, I kind of prefer to work with the black population because I want to give back to my community, which I came from, which I can identify with most. Let me see if I can change, because y'all, this sun is like steaming. But, well, that's much better. Ooh, feeling like much cooler. That sun was eating me up. Okay, so, yeah, you have black uh, therapists and even, you know, upcoming therapist students who will say, you know, my preference is working with uh, my community. But white people, you're not going to hear them say, oh, I, prefer only, I prefer to work with white people. Like, they're not going to say that because they want to be politically correct. I get it. You know, it makes perfect sense. But we know everybody has a bias. I mean, that's the, the meat and bones of my research, implicit racial biases in children. But generally speaking, in my research lab, that's my focus is looking at implicit racial bias and just people all together, not just African-American children. African American adults, teenagers, and even white people. Everybody got their biases, man. And it's better, I think, to come forward with your biases and be able to recognize and acknowledge them as opposed to deny and say, oh, no, I don't see race. I'm not biased. It's like that's bullshit. So, as it relates to emotionality and psychotherapy uh, um, and working with people from different cultures, the whole thing about black people not feeling understood, how black people. All right, the way we express our emotions is different. And it's been said even in, uh, in the literature and research that even Asians express their emotions differently, right? So I brought it up in my class. And you know, I know my professor had the nerve to say, oh, well, yeah, the researcher said that. But he pretty much dismissed what the research said to say that, oh, that's found out to be not true. Now, I think the way he tried to basically justify and rationalize the whole situation because I think he kind of felt defensive when I started to talk about how, well, in my experience and observation, not all emotions are observable, number one. So to say, oh, black people, we're just emotionally blunted and we don't express our emotions, that's bullshit. Because some emotions you just can't see. It don't matter if you're black or white. They are not observable to the human eye. That's common sense. Some emotions, yes, you can readily see. Like the six primary emotions, uh, four of them actually are negative emotions. Anger, disgust, uh, sadness, and I think fear. Yeah, fear, anger, sadness, and disgust. And then the other two are happiness and surprise. So it's like two positive emotions out of the six primary and then four negative emotions out of the six primary. Interesting that how most of them are negative, so to speak. But those primary, six primary emotions are said to be universal, meaning that it, they are experienced in the same way across different cultures, no matter what culture or nation you come from. I'm like, okay, I get that. But let's not ignore that there are certain emotions that are not observable to the human eye. And when I brought that up in class, do you not know, like, he came with this defense to say, well, because like, he was asking, like, what kind of example do you have? And I say, oh, let's say, for example, if a person feels guilt or if a person feels determined, 
a, a person may feel challenged. You may not necessarily see that with the human eye. Right? And the reason why I brought that up, because part of this class and his expectation of the class is that we um, invest in the class emotionally, right? And I got something to say about that. But one of his stipulations, he has three. One of the stipulations um, center on this whole idea about emotionality, which is the reason why I feel like I had to do this video. Because it's like, I got things I got to say. And yes, I brought this up in class, but... The class is only but so long, you know, so, and there's other students in the class, so I can't be talking forever and ever and ever, and there's another point, it's like, he kind of pointed out, I was like, oh, well, I got this feeling that you're more emotionally invested in your vlog than you are in this class. I'm like, first of all, you can't compare my vlog to this class because my vlog, number one, I get the entire floor, and there's no other classmates, so I get the entire floor, and I get to speak and speak and speak. In class, they don't have that luxury. Because you will be considered a not monopolizer if you just talk, 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 talk the whole entire class. It's not all about me. The other students are that are in the class. So I have a respect for that. And then secondly, with it only being me and me having the floor, yes, I get to express myself and be, you know, more emotionally expressive. You know? And it's on topics that I feel passionate about. So I get to choose the topics, which also factors into my freedom of expression on my vlog, as opposed to in class. I mean, it's kind of... It's, yes, it's free-flowing, but at the same time, it's not that we get to choose our topics. So some things that may be brought up in class, I may can relate to on an emotional level. And then some topics, you know, not that I can't relate to. I feel like I can relate to almost anything, but on an emotional level... There's a difference to that. There's something to be said about that. And so being that he has this kind of expectation that people show up emotionally. And he called me out on it saying that, oh, well, he don't think that I'm emotionally invested. And I'm just like, you know me, I'm always thinking. And I felt like with him being a white professor and me being African American, it's like he's not, he's missing something. Because to say I'm not emotionally invested is to say that I'm not invested at all. That's lies. Because I'm always invested psychologically, emotionally, and physically. I'm there. Because I said that, you know, I'm here. And he was like, oh, well, it doesn't mean just because you're physically here doesn't mean nothing. Like, it's about you being emotionally present. And I'm wondering because I noticed that I observe and I pay attention to everything, right? And I noticed that his reaction when some, like, students cry in the class... You know, it's when they display more of the negative emotions, the primary universal emotions, that they display one of those four. You know, if it's sadness, you know, or dis not really necessarily disgust, I guess. Disgust could be one that he favors, but it's mostly like sadness or anger, you know, or fear or vulnerability. It's like he hones in on that, right? And he even mentioned that, oh, well, the, the currency of this class is emotions. And I'm like, it, that's bullshit. It's not so much emotions. It's the negative emotions. He has a bias in favor of the people showing negative emotions. And I'm like, okay, if I am a kind of person that I'm pretty much content with where I am in life right now. Like, not to say I don't have stresses, but the number of stresses that I have is very low in my life, even though I'm in a PhD program, because I'm pretty much maintaining homeostasis, like, I'm a third year, it's not like I'm a first year, so things are going pretty smoothly in my life right now, like, I don't, I mean, knock on wood, but I'm just saying, like, life is good, so... I'm trying to, sometimes I get confused because it's like he is ex expecting something of me that is not even applicable to where I'm at in my life right now. Whereas other students may come to class and they're crying and, you know, he kind of interprets their expression of crying and tears as being more emotionally invested than, let's say, if a student comes to class and they're smiling. Because I come to class and a lot of times I'm smiling. And even when I interact with other members of the group, my reaction, like, I'm smiling. I'm smiling because, number one, like, I feel, I smile for a lot of things. And a lot of times I just feel, I feel good. I feel, I don't know, I feel, like, determined or maybe I feel inspired by something that the person says. Like, and for me, like, I think another thing when it comes to a, a misattunement with the professor and trying to interpret my feelings 
as an African-American woman is that he projects a lot of his interpretations of how he would be or how a white person may feel within a certain context. So let's say, for example, in the class, if students are confronting me on certain different things, and I've been confronted a lot, mysteriously, like I am, isn't, I think it's no coincidence that I, yes, I am the only African American in the class, and at the same time, I am the one who has been singled out the most and has endured the most confrontation in the class. And even with that confrontation, it's like, I don't, for me, I don't feel bad. Like, I've been confronted a lot on social media, and a lot of times my reaction is like, I'm, I'm smiling. Like, what, what do you expect me to do? And I think for him, his expectation is, oh, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to cry, or I'm supposed to feel offended, or be angry. And if that's not my experience, that's not my experience. You can't force me to be a way that I am not. That I don't feel that way, that I'm just, I don't feel that way. So I just feel like, yes, I feel, a lot of times black people, we get misunderstood and we get missed. And I think also with this whole perception that people have, you know, like white people may have of black people, that sometimes I think we're all the same. Because he mentioned in class how he had an African-American student, female, who wouldn't say anything for like halfway through the semester in the class. And, and when he kept, when he was telling the story, he kept looking at me because obviously I'm an African-American female student in his class. And so he, he tried to make a parallel, I was, I was thinking, like, between me and her to say, okay, well, come to find out, she said that she felt uncomfortable with being the only black student in the class. And I'm just like, that ain't necessarily me. This is not my first time being around all white people. It's like, hello, I live in America. <laughs> like, this... Me being the only black person, that's nothing new. I've been in class where I've been the only black person. So it's not about, oh, I feel like I'm the only black person. And, and by the way, I've spoken out in class. I've actually led discussions in class. I've been the first to speak up in class. So to for him to say that and look at me as he was saying that, I felt like he was trying to say that, oh, well, maybe that's my experience. And I'm just like, perhaps he see all black people the same. He see that, okay... Because he had a student, African American student, who had this difficulty speaking out, then perhaps maybe I may have a difficulty speaking out. I'm like, no, I don't have a difficulty speaking out. I never have a difficulty expressing myself. Now, yes, I am considerate of other people's feelings. And so if a student, if I say something in class and students say, oh, well, I'm offended by that, then I may be more careful about what I choose to share. I mean, obviously, because I'm not necessarily trying to offend people. But at the same time, it's like, in my being careful of wanting to protect other people's feelings, it's like I still get confronted or, you know, attacked, so to speak, which I don't necessarily feel attacked. I mean, when I think of attack, I feel like, you know, like, you'll know if I'm attacked because tears be coming down my eyes if I feel like I'm attacked. Like, I got attacked on social media, and there was no hiding that because the feelings were there, but in class, I'm like... I don't feel like I, I'm attacked. I may feel challenged. And that's another thing. The feeling or emotion of being challenged, you may not necessarily see. Um, you may just be, see me sitting like this. And I may be smiling. And that's the thing. Like, for him, he has a, his, he has this expectation I'm supposed to be like, oh, my gosh, I'm, I'm challenged and I'm supposed to retreat. That's not black people. So I feel like that's where he's missing us, his understanding of who black people are. White people need a history lesson. It's like, we as black people, we've been around white people. So if you want to say that, I guess we are more culturally exposed to different people from different cultures, we have no choice to be amongst white people. I mean, we live in a white-dominated society. So we're used to them. The question is, are they used to us? Do they quite understand us? We've been around them a lot. We were their slaves. We know white people. What, if anything, white people know black people. We know ourselves and we know them. The question is, do they quite know us? Because if, from their perspective, they live in a, dominated, a white dominated society where the world is theirs, they don't necessarily have to make an effort to understand who we are. Whereas, no, we do. Our livelihood depends on getting an understanding of this white culture. We have to. Every other so-called minor, non-minority group 
has to have an understanding of what this white dominated society means in order to survive in it. You get what I'm saying? Whereas with them, if you own the world, you own the society, you don't have to make a, an attempt or effort to understand people who are minority groups because it's like, oh, who cares about them? You know, we own shit. We're going to dictate and be successful anyway. Whereas with the minority groups, it's like part of our survival to need to know who they are and how to maneuver and operate in their system. And I just feel like white people miss us so much. They don't understand where we're coming from because they don't have to, so to speak. And even though, yes, in certain institutions, they have this push for cultural diversity, it's like they teach it, but they don't walk it. They don't walk it. Because if he's going to make this generalization to assume that just because white people may cry when they're under pressure and feeling challenged, so we as black people, we're supposed to cry. No, black people, and that goes back to how I opened this video earlier, speaking about the, the difficulties that one of my colleagues face and working with the prison population, that people just don't get it. Black people, we have been vulnerable for so long of our lives. So much of our lives, we've been vulnerable, right? So, I think at this point in our lives, we feel like it's time to be strong. It's nothing wrong with that. It's time for us to be strong. Yes, you can say one can make the argument that for so much of our lives, we've been strong. So, maybe now we should be vulnerable. But I would like to make the argument to, to explain this sense of we got to be strong and we can't show vulnerabilities that no we've been vulnerable for so much of our lives and what did that vulnerability mean even my supervisor who was african-american my director of training at my clinical site she pointed this out and i'm like she gets it because she said it so perfectly and well she was like black people the vulnerability could cost of our cut and historically, it could have cost us our lives to show any signs or emotion or feelings of vulnerability. Historic, and even to the present day, it could cost us our lives in certain community contexts, right? So, it's interesting how it's like you have professors in psychology to want to make this push towards for black people to be, I guess, emotionally expressive or vulnerable. And it's like, it's almost like trying to change the way a person has been. In my clinical training at my site, we're uh, going over Gottman. And we were talking about, in this week in supervision, we were talking about how there are certain behaviors within the context of a marriage that are flexible to change and some behaviors that are more resistant to change. Now, the flexible behaviors they were saying that's resistant to change, some small things like where you put the toothpaste, you know, or where you put your shoes. Whereas certain behaviors in terms of, let's say, communication style, or even the way that a person expresses themselves emotionally, those kinds of things are more resistant to change. That's what she said, and that's not just what she said, but that's what the theory says. And I'm like, bingo, that makes perfect sense. The sun is just changing all the way around, y'all. But I'm like, bingo, that makes perfect sense. Finally, someone gets it. And to force African Americans from a cultural perspective, as it relates to emotionality, to just automatically... You know, especially as it relates to this class, I mean, group therapy, to come in this class that's only, how many weeks? 30 weeks long because it's two semesters and each semester is 15 weeks. For some, to expect to an African American just come in there and just change automatically and to display certain emotions that don't even match my experience per se. It's like, that's a whole nother thing. It's so very complicated. Humans are very complicated, right? So that's the reason why I want to make this video to kind of add more insight to this topic. Because not even speaking from personal experience or, or about my own experience, but just speaking about Amer uh, African Americans, period, and even certain populations, and particularly prison prisoners, you know, African Americans, who therapists say present as 
uh, effectively blunted, you know, like they kind of hold their emotions in. It's just like, hello? If they've been living that way, right, all their life, just like with Gottman theory, if a person has been communicating in a certain style all their entire life, to expect them just to say, all right, you in therapy now, so you're just going to change the way you communicate automatically. It don't work that way. Certain behaviors are more resistant to change. The way a person's a person uh, expresses themselves emotionally is more stable over time. That's more resistant to change. And I think it's unfair and it's being culturally dismissive to not take that cultural aspect into consideration, that cultural difference into consideration. We talk about cultural diversity, but you have to be able to appreciate that if a person, if a prisoner, African American, and you gotta be necessarily a prisoner, but just an African American or a person who comes from a certain group, and like I say, it's not just specific to racial ethnic minorities, it can be um, gender. It can be a gender cultural difference where men have just been socialized to not be as emotionally dramatic and expressive, and especially when it comes to expressing vulnerability and crying. And if we're gonna say we're gonna be culturally competent, why let's not be so oppressive of their culture whether it's a, a male gender or african-american ethnic I identity and their ethnic culture let's not be oppressive of that cultural difference to force them to say oh you need to cry cry you need to show that emotion it's like let's how about we be more flexible because we know since certain communication styles or ways of expressing oneself is more resistant to change but we know that therapists we're pretty flexible that's i mean that's our job right to be flexible and helping them move towards a healthier way of being that's the kind of therapist i want to be and i am anyway to be flexible in the room you know and to be able to adapt not to try to put people in my round hole so to speak put a pusher square through a, a round hole to make them fit let me check the time because i need to go by the bank no that ain't the way i want to be forcing somebody to uh, that's 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 white supremacy right there that's so that's so like white supremacy to say oh well this is how the dominant culture does it so this is how everybody need to do it no no if a man feels more comfortable suppressing his vulnerability and his tears, then let men do that. There's a time for men to cry. They will cry when they're ready to cry. But to say, there's this expectation and you need to do this, which is what I'm seeing in my class, and knowing that it may impact someone's grade because they don't meet the class expectations. And I ain't just speaking for myself, I'm talking about the men in the class who have been vulnerable, but they haven't necessarily physically express that vulnerability in terms of tears to know that okay it could impact their grade it's like no that that's unfair that's so unfair that's so culturally incompetent and dismissive it's like you can't do that to a person to just especially a student they're gonna just expect them to walk in that class and oh they're just gonna change who they are like no that's part of who they are being strong is part of what a man is, right? The idea of being strong. That's their part of their identity. And just to force your way of thinking and behaving onto them to impose how they should be, that's not being culturally sensitive. So I have to bring that to the forefront. I had to do that. I had to say that because that's, that's wrong, man. And for it to have that as a stipulation for a class expectation. Because when he defined it, it was like, oh, you're not emotionally invested. I'm like, that's bullshit. Granted, I've cried. I've been vulnerable in that class. And I've had tears come down my freaking eyes. But I guess he didn't appreciate that. Because he has his perspective of the way black people express their emotions and maybe he's expecting me to be angry and overly reactive and that's just not who I am he has a false assumption so I had to make that video this video and I just want to encourage you know counselors therapists 
I wouldn't like typically counselors and therapists don't they're not really subscribed to my YouTube channel but being that I'm a PSU student and I talk about topics that are relevant and that I'm inspired to talk about and so this is just one of them so perhaps maybe a therapist or a psychologist may see this video and I do encourage you guys to just take what I say into consideration and in working with certain I guess y'all want to call it difficult populations difficult being that it's something that you're not used to it doesn't fit the mold so to speak just different Criminals, prisoners have a way of expressing their emotions. They do it in a different way. And I even suggested to my colleague that perhaps you can have them journal. Because I do know a lot of a lot of inmates, they love that. The whole, um, what they call it, the, the pen pal, you know. They love doing it. I had, I actually used to write prisoners, you know, in jail. And they love writing. And they wasn't so much concerned about, oh, somebody finding their journal. No, they trusted the person, their pen pal, who they were writing, you know. And granted, there's hardly any privacy in prison anyway, because I remember the pen person, the inmate that I was a pen pal with, like he would say, they would open his mail before he got it. He got the mail and it was already open. They wanted to see what it is that they were getting. So they don't really have much privacy in jail. So, I mean, in terms of, oh, wow, I want to make sure that nobody read my journal. I don't think that's one of their biggest concerns. I think that it's beneficial to consider that inmates like to write. A lot of them, they're very talented. They love to journal. They like to express themselves in words, man. They're poets. They become, like, you know, artists in jail, writing all these poems and stuff. And not only that, but a lot of them like to draw different things. You know, inmates like to do different things. They have different ways of expressing themselves. And it's important that therapists who work in prisons understand that not everybody is going to be feel comfortable saying, I feel hurt. Not every male prisoner is going to feel comfortable verbalizing that. That doesn't mean that they're not committed to treatment. They may feel better drawing it or painting it, you know, or journaling it in different ways or even acting it out. You know, do drama therapy where you get two prisoners up there and they can act out how they feel, you know. They can show it as opposed to say it, you know, or expressing it verbally. They don't have to cry. Those don't force the tears to come. They're going to come. Trust me, a person can only hold on to them tears for so long. The more they hold on to it, when that release comes, oh, baby, that, that flow is going to come. The floodgates are going to open up because they've held it in for so long. And they gonna, it's probably going to take them a long time to stop crying. So don't get so caught up in trying to force clients or, you know, your professor force a student to express themselves in a way you think that they are feeling. You don't know how they're feeling. It's better to ask, well, how do you feel? I'm wondering how you're feeling right now, you know? And give them many different ways on showing that and expressing it. They may can't say it in words. They may don't even have language to say it. You know, some people's vocabularies aren't that expansive, so they may not have the words to say, you know, that they feel a certain kind of way. You know, but maybe they can act it out. Maybe they could draw it. Or do different things. Just, I'm just saying, just be flexible. But you know, that's something that's eating me up. So I think I pretty much said what I wanted to say in this video. I'm going to go ahead and end it here. And I'll catch you guys in the next one. Love you guys. Bye.